On July 5th, my best friend saved my life. He didn't carry me out of a burning building or take a bullet for me. I met him at his apartment. We got into a cab. We drove down Lakeshore Drive and pulled up to a red brick house in Chicago's Gold Coast. We passed through the gate, walked in the front door, and I told the receptionist that I needed help. He stood behind me and waited. Four days later, on a Monday, I started a rehab for drug addiction. And what was remarkable about the experience was not the people, although they are the most amazing people I have ever met. What was remarkable was the way that the program built a commonality and community and trust, not just overnight, but instantaneously. For the past 83 days, I have found belonging and purpose, inspiration and accountability in ways I have never felt, in places I have never been. Each day of my recovery, I have listened to people tell their stories of shame and struggle, of hardship and heartache, of humility and joy, and found support in the words, kindness, and confidence of others. Some friends, some strangers, some addicted to alcohol, some addicted to drugs, all shades of the same problem, all brought together by a desire to lead the most meaningful, fulfilling lives we are able to, and recognizing that we can only lead that most meaningful life if we are sober. That Recovering from our hurt requires commonality and community and trust. It requires telling our own stories and listening as others tell theirs. Whether we are struggling with addiction, depression, or both, whether we experienced trauma or we didn't, what Ever the reason or how much we hurt, telling our stories helps hurt people become healed people. A few years ago, I went out in the dark of night in the dead of winter with a group of volunteers searching for unsheltered homeless people to help get them into a warm place for the night. We visited a local hospital emergency room where homeless folks sometimes go when it is bitter cold out. We asked if there were any patients who appeared to be homeless and if they would speak with us. There was, and he did. His name was Terrence. He was my age. He was bipolar. He was homeless for the first time and he had used drugs within the past 24 hours. And not having insurance or the ability to pay, he could not get in to see a psychiatrist for three months. Now, how can we expect Terrence to stay housed and employed and get where he needs to go without having an episode if we can't get him in to see a psychiatrist for three months? My chance encounter with Terrence changed the way I thought about America's mental health crisis. His story inspired me to act years before I would confront my own addiction and my own depression. Why is it so much easier to tell other people's stories and so very hard to tell our own? Many of us live with a fear that somehow our struggles are unique. The struggles we face can't possibly be haunting the family in the house across the street or the person in front of us at the grocery store. 
their lawns are always green, and their shopping carts look so full. We think that our lives are so much more crazy and more screwed up than the person sitting next to us. But the truth is, they're not. They're just not. I know this because it is in telling our stories that hurt people can become healed people. But changing the way we think about, talk about, and treat America's mental health crisis starts with changing the stories we tell ourselves. When we aren't honest with ourselves, it's always our friend Joe from Bible study who is the alcoholic. When we are honest with ourselves, we acknowledge we are the alcoholic and we don't actually go to Bible study. There are the curated lives we lead on Facebook that we want everyone to see. And there are the real lives we lead with parts of it we don't want anyone to ever see. I, for one, was really good at leading double lives, or so I thought. I was a gay man who tried to be straight through college. I was an extroverted introvert that self-medicated with alcohol. I was a man in the public eye who always had people around me, but never felt more alone. I was HIV positive and perpetually ashamed, afraid, and self-destructive because of it. My loneliness turned to isolation, and I turned to drugs. I was a gay Republican in the suburbs, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> if you look up the definition of self-loathing in the dictionary, it should read gay Republican. <laughs> and even worse, the definition of isolation should read gay Republican in the suburbs. <laughs> so the story I told myself was that I was a lonely, alcohol and drug addicted, HIV positive, gay elected official, and a Republican in the suburbs. I was an egomaniac with a raging inferiority complex, and I was the only one on earth who could possibly understand. But the most miraculous thing happened when I walked into that red brick house into our group therapy session, sat down next to a woman with a vibrant energy and bleach blonde rock and roll hair who I didn't think I had much in common with. And I told the group about one of the most bizarre, humiliating, awful things that happened to me when I was in active addiction. Thoroughly embarrassed, I took a deep breath and settled in for the gasps from the nine other people sitting in the circle of chairs with me. But there were no gasps. No one's jaw dropped. No one clutched their pearls. And that bleach blonde rock and roll chick, she turned towards me and said, that same thing happened to me too. But that isn't usually the case. We are hardwired to yearn for connection and belonging, but we're also conditioned by culture to bottle up our shame. And not just bottle it up and take it, but to dish it out. I call it shame reciprocity. Reciprocity comes from the Latin word reciprocus, which means returning the same way. We feel shame, we are ashamed of our shame, so we deal with it by putting shame on other people. It works like this. I'm ashamed of who I am and what I did, but it is much easier to process how shameful you are and what you should do about it. That is shame reciprocity. Oftentimes when the word should is preceded by a directive, command, or even seemingly polite suggestion, it's quite possibly a healthy dose of shame reciprocity. Shame reciprocity will not heal ourselves or other people. It will stagnate healing and kickstart hurt. 
Shame reciprocity spreads the stigma that surrounds mental illness and addiction. But telling our stories helps hurt people become healed people. But changing the way we think about and talk about mental health and addiction means we also have to change the way we act on it. When we treat people suffering with mental health challenges or addiction as moral defects, criminals, or lost causes, they're likely to end up in one of four places. Our jails, homeless on our streets, our emergency rooms, or dead. None of those are good options. If we treated cancer like we currently treat mental health and addiction, it would work like this. If the disease was diagnosed, a big if, we would cut out the tumor, stitch the person back up, and send them on their way. No radiation, no chemo, no medication. No effort to arrest the spread of the cancer, only an effort to arrest the individual for the behavior resulting from their disease. And by the way, insurance companies would likely reject the claim. Congress would probably cut funding for essential services and programs, and local village boards would vote down plans for much needed supportive housing. We have systematically disinvested in our mental health care system, including addiction treatment, for decades. And it's just wrong. But when we treat addiction and mental health as a person and not a problem, we invest in programs to incentivize people to become therapists and psychiatrists. We fund job training and retraining programs. We build supportive housing. We expand mentorship and fellowship programs. We encourage people to seek help. When we treat addiction and mental health as a person and not a problem, we care about Terrence being able to get in to see a psychiatrist before he is in crisis. In order to change the way we think about, talk about, and act on addiction and mental health, we also have to change the words we use. When we think about addiction in terms of drugs, we think of heroin addicts overdosing with dirty needles in back alleys, nameless bodies thrown in dumpsters, reported and forgotten on the evening news. We think of homeless people strung out, living under bridges. But when we think about addiction in terms of people, it's our sons, our daughters, and student athletes. It's our dads, our teachers, and our doctors, all suffering from a human condition. When we talk about addiction consequentially, it's a war on drugs. When we talk about addiction unconditionally, it is a fight to save those we love from its grasp. For those who feel as if there is nowhere to go, Go to a place where you feel commonality and community and trust and tell your story. And for those who, like me, suffered for so long, who fell so far and hurt so much, I can promise you that it doesn't matter how much you have lost how far you have fallen, how many times you slipped up, what your rock bottom was, or how hard you hit it. You can do it. You are worth it. You are enough. 
just listen because it is telling our stories that can help hurt people become healed people. It makes us hopeful people. It makes us happier people. Thank you.